Um, so, um, thank you so much for being here. I'm Hilary Chute. Um, I am the author of four books about comics and graphic narratives, um, the most recent of which is coming out in December, and I brought my galleys just for fun. Um, so here's the cover. Thank you. So um, what I thought we would do is um, have everybody introduce him or herself, um, and then we'll open it up for um, discussion um, among the panelists, and then there'll be a QA and a with the audience um, toward the end of the hour. But first I just wanted to give a really brief sense of um, why I was interested in organizing this panel and why I'm so especially interested to be hearing from this group of people. So um, it's really exciting to me that on this panel we have people who are um, so interdisciplinary and diverse in their own creative practices and in their own scholarship. So, um, you know, we have practicing poets, cartoonists, professors, um, critics on this panel in a really nice uh, mix. So, and, um, well, let, let me put it another way. I'd like to discuss on this panel a, a sense of how people have thought about the connection between comics and poetry in the past. So what's been going on in the past few decades with how people are thinking about this um, intersection. And then also how people are thinking about it now. And, and the question, is it even really productive and useful to um, keep on pursuing this connection between comics and poetry? I clearly do think it is. I actually um, published a piece in um, the journal Poetry, which I brought here in 2013. And the title of the piece is Secret Labor. And it, it's a piece um, pretty short, uh, comparing comics as a form to poetry as a form. Mm -hmm. And I was surprised when um, The Atlantic Online published a rebuttal called um, The Promise and Danger of Comparing Comic Books to Poetry. So I'm, I'm curious what um, panelists think about the connection and what it, and what it gets us. So, I don't know in what order we want to go in, but for introducing ourselves, why don't we go in some kind of order? Let's start with Stephanie or with Hi, is this, is this thing on? Yes. Yeah, there are also there are two uh, relatively young listeners who have chosen seats with an obstructed view, uh, one of whom uh, lives in my house and is one of the kids. <laughs> so, and uh, uh, Sophie and Nathan, if you want to come up here where you can see things. <laughs> Sophie, I saw you behind a column. <laughs> okay. Hi, thank you for being here. You know, so there's seats up front if people want to come. Yeah. Hi. So I'm Stephanie Burt, and uh, I teach at Harvard, and um, mostly I teach people how to read poetry, but also sometimes I teach them how to read comics and read novels of spaceships and other things. Um, and I write books about how to read poetry, and I do a lot of poetry reviewing. Uh, I publish poems that are by me. Uh, there's a, a publisher who wanted to hear this, a brand new book of poems by me that came out like two weeks ago. Um, and it has comics material in it. Actually, all of my books of poetry by me have comics material in it, and it's all, uh, it's almost all the references are like superhero comics rather than the many other kinds of comics that are celebrated in this building right now. Um, and I do review and write about uh, various kinds uh, and strands of comics, but I can't draw. <laughs> Hey, uh, my name is Chris Spain. Uh, I'm a grad student at Harvard, but Steph is one of my advisors. Uh, and uh, I guess I come to this panel first as just a really big fan. Um, comics and poetry are the two things I read most, besides my emails <laughs> and, uh, and Twitter and articles about how the world's going to end. Um, and I also come as someone who's taught both of those things. I had the pleasure of both teaching for Steph, teaching in a poetry course. I'm teaching for Hillary and of course about comics in uh, consecutive semesters. And those are very different experiences, even though the two art forms sometimes seem to me to be very similar. So maybe we'll get to that right now. Hi there. 
I'm Franklin Ninespark, and I was one of the people who started doing something that we were actually calling comics poetry back in the mid 2000s. I put up a website called The Moon Fell On Me. It's at themoonfellonme.com. Amazingly, the name wasn't taken. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, actually, just published something on that this morning. So if you want to check that out, that's um, fresh comics poetry. I also did the first anthology of comics poetry. Uh, it's called. Com and she's got. <laughs> this is just me doing show and tell. So she's not talking. <laughs> Can we buy that here? Uh, I have three copies on me. <laughs> so you get the first one. For you, special price. Uh, so anyway, I, I did the first comp excuse me, the first Compass Poetry Anthology, and um, a few others have come out since then. There's also a very good journal uh, called Ink Brick that I've been in a couple of times. Uh, and I'm led to understand that Ink Brick was inspired by this thing, so that was cool. And um, other than that, I'm an artist and art critic, and, uh, and I'm here in Boston. My name is Madeline Witt. Is this, is this good? Is that on? Is it on? It doesn't sound it's not on. Hello. Hello? Yeah. There yes. My name is Madeline Witt. Uh, I'm a cartoonist and I make poetry comics. Uh, and I recently, this year, uh, edited and organized uh, a collection of poetry comics about climate change called Warmer, which really is yeah, and so I'm, I'm really, I mean, I love I love poetry myself, but I think, uh, yeah, my main engagement here is that I make, uh, I use comics to make poetry. Yeah. Great. Um, can I borrow your mic? Yeah. Um, thank you, everybody. So I think um, to start off with, um, maybe we could hear a little bit um, about some of the more formal movements or scenes that have built up around the connection of comics and poetry. So maybe this is a question for Franklin um, and for Madeline, since you know you mentioned that this was the first anthology. Could you sort of explain what you were um, going for with this, or what, what inspired you to put it together? Yeah, this is one of those things that comes up every now and again in my life, where I wonder, why doesn't this exist? And then I'm the one who ends up making it. But so why did you wonder why it didn't exist? Because there were these uh, there were these folks around. We all sort of found each other um, over the internet. This, this is a geographically spread group, and it's interesting to think about that as a scene because typically art scenes in the past have been geographic scenes. People were meeting at the Cedar Tavern and were meeting in Montmartre. Or, Folks knew each other, they ran into each other in the street. And this didn't work like that. This was a lot of folks who found each other on Facebook. But so what was the thing that all of the people were interested in? Like, how would you name it? Well, everybody was describing what they were doing as either comics poetry or poetry comics or comics as poetry or something like that. They were taking the language, the syntax of comics and doing with it what poets do with the syntax of words. So when you have words to work with, you can do a lot of interesting things. When you have words and word balloons and panels and drawings, there are a lot more things you can do. And so what I was trying to do in the anthology was get a range of work between stuff that was a fairly straightforward reading experience on some level, like my work is. I, I work with panels and I expect the panels to be read in a certain order. So I don't do a lot of subversion of the comic syntax itself. And then you have people like Jason Overby, who you're pretty much just looking at this thing, and if you can find a way through it as a comic, then good on you. And, and then a lot of stuff in between. Uh, uh, somebody like Warren Craghead who was doing, he's definitely working with the panel structure, but the way that he's loading those panels up kind of defies reading on some level. And then um, and then you have folks like um, Derek Badman who, actually Derek Badman did a wonderful piece for this book, I'm really pleased with that one. He's arranged, it, it looks very straightforward as a comic in that it sort of references this kind of 1950s style and the, the type is all the word ones and that sort of thing, but he's arranged the panels in a triangle that will not really tell you which way it's supposed to be read and depending on how you go through it, you get very different readings out of it. So. There are, nobody has the same approach that they bring to this, which is why it was so much fun that everybody's calling it 
calm exposure. So, and I'm sorry to keep pushing on this, but I, but I, but I think it's, it's, it's interesting, right, at least to me, to figure out what are we really talking about when we talk about comics and poetry? So when is something poetry comics versus just comics or versus just poetry? Or is, is that distinction even valuable? Yeah, I mean, I think to sort of answer that and to sort of answer your previous question, I came to poetry comics from making other sorts of more narrative and, and non-fiction comics, and I'm just, yeah, I love uh, the medium of comics and that, like the way that the combination of, of images and text in sequence can be magical. Um, and I, yeah, I looking at people like Andrew White and Alyssa Bird, um, I was, yeah, I was struck by the way that this medium that I love could also function to say things that were subtler and like sort of speak to people emotionally and spiritually in the way that text-only poetry um, speaks to me and, and that I like enjoyed the text-only poetry. I would add to that that the I see that you have Dave Morris on the on the table over here. The one distinction that I made as far as my book was concerned is that I didn't want to include anyone who had taken a written poem and then turned it into a comic. Right. So we're not talking about adaptation. We're not talking about adaptation. We're and we're not talking about illustration. Or no, no, that's a question. I don't know if we're. I think we might still be talking about illustration, but okay. we're not talking about we're not talking about the illustrating of a poem. Uh, that was written as a poem, in my case, by someone else. I wanted to work, the, the anthology is exclusively people who are both the artist and the writer. Okay. And, uh, but that, that was the one distinction that I didn't make. I didn't want somebody to take a poem and illustrate it or turn it into a poem. So, uh, that is a distinction not, that I make between poetry comics and comics poetry. Okay. Poetry comics, uh, and, and not not that's not a value judgment on any level. Of course, I think Dave Morris does really interesting work, but it is a definite. It's a definitely different, definitely a different exercise to go to take a poem and turn it into a comic than it is to take comics and turn it into poetry. Okay, I just um, put up a slide of um, Madeline's work behind you, so that's what people um, are looking at as you were talking. Um, so today I got an email from Stephanie and, and she wrote me that she was interested in thinking about ideas and modes of reading that link poetry as a practice analogically to comics. Steph, do you want to pick up on that? Sure. So there is, uh, there are two, th there is the particular kind of evolving art form that Madeline and the particular kind of evolving art form that Madeline and Frank are describing that is lyric. And of course, not all poetry is lyric, and that is comics. And that's great. And it's got a prehistory of people doing, using similar effects with text and pictures, not calling it poetry comics or comic poetry. Um, in Raymond Pettibon's art and Joe Brainer, going back to sort of late New York school stuff. I love that stuff. I have nothing distinctive to say about it. I'm just a fan. Um, there's a separate history of people who write poems that are just made of words, writing about comics and using genre indicators and characters who come from comics. Um, and poets using capes, poets using superhero genres, uh, in ways where the poem would exist if the superhero weren't present in the poet's mind. It's become a big thing in the US and in Britain since the 90s, and I've written about that, and I'm, I'm afraid I'm a part of it. Um, and there's uh, some of you may know Monica Yoon's terrific book, Ignatz, which is an entire book of literary poetry, no pictures, that would not exist without Crazy Cat. It's, it's, every, incredible book. it's, it's one of the best books of the past 10 years. And every single poem in it refers in some way to Crazy Cat in a way that all of George Herbert's poems refer to the New Testament. <laughs> um, so particular comics, comics, genres, comics, characters, and poems. Those two things are great. But I wanted to talk about a third thing, which I guess means I'm doing literary theory, which I used to say I never did. Yeah? 
um, which is comics as a practice, comics as a medium has some things in common with poetry as a practice, poetry as a way of using words, that neither one has with other ways of using words and pictures. Does this make sense? Um, four things. Four things. Four, four things. things? Four things. Okay. Yeah. Um, Do any of the visuals that you sent me correspond to the four things? Kind of. Okay. Do you want to name one? Uh, so the first one is, and, and they're actually, you can see them all in the same kind of ridiculous mainstream comics panel that I sent. Okay, so we'll uh, back to some of these other things. Let's see. But uh, that, we'll start with that one. It's not a very high resolu resolution image, so could you, okay. first of all, oh, you know explain what? what this image Why don't you go, is? Do you want to go back to the pound? Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay, so thank you for bringing this up before I could ask you about it. That's useful. <laughs> so this is um, obviously the famous um, Imagist poem from 1913, and Steph sent me this um, slide this morning. Thank you. I didn't. You didn't have to. I was just like yeah, the other. I was going to ask you about it anyway. So, or ask okay. everybody about it. So everyone, feel free to jump in here. Um, okay. So, so this is a just yeah and. Do, you don't have to stand up, but you can. Okay, I'm looking at because this is this is a famous two-line poem. One of the more famous two-line poems in English uh, from the early 20th century, and he's uh, a pound is in the Paris metro, and he's describing what he sees, and he's connecting two different images. One of which is what he sees, one of which is an analogy for what he sees, and what makes it work as not just as poetic but as poetry and as verse is that there's a line break. And the line break reminds you that you have to do some mental work connecting line one to line two. And comics work like that. But in comics, if you're a Scott McCloud fan, uh, instead of a line break, you say we have a gut. Or we have panels. Or we have closure. So, is your hand up? No, I'm just showing That's fine. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, sorry. <laughs> so, Comics invites us to connect two things that may or may not seem connected anyway by reading over a break that is also a continuity. And in poetry, we call that line breaks. And you can have prose poems just like you can have comics that don't have panel borders. But in both cases, you're violating an expectation that's in the background anyway. So closure, the gutter, the line break, the panel border. That's one thing. Second thing is something that is at its most obvious when we think about superhero continuity, when we think about sort of 50 years of the Marvel Universe, it's there in Love and Rocket, it's there in Dex to Watch Out For, it's there in long running serial forms as well, there in Crazy Cat, which is super continuity. The comic asks, it expects its readers, after it's been going on for a while, to know its history. So this is behind you, um, the right. Next to Watch Out For by Alison Bechtel um, image that you sent me from um, 1999 called Holidays on Ice. Do you want yes. to explain why you sent me this image? Um, I just wanted to almost remain the Next to Watch Out For. Okay. This is one of the ones that was online anyway. Um, it's got a lot of characters who you're supposed to know, uh, and it's got multiple intersecting backstories. I mean, it could have used, used Doonesbury. Um, I happen to be thinking about Beckville anyway, because I just saw the fun home musical, it was the best thing I've ever seen in a theater. And it was, yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, this is a sort of non-superhero example of a lot of continuity, and the comic would like you to like it, even if it's your first comic, but the ideal reader knows who these people are, and knows what milieus they move through, which include previous comics, and previous, frankly, drawing styles, since Beckville is very aware of it. At this point, she's sort of the third generation of people drawing comic strips for their weeklies <clears throat> and, and for you know, all weeklies. Um, and if you want to go to the, the Defender strip? Okay, so yeah. will you describe what this is for people who might not know what this is? It which is, includes me. Yeah, <laughs> it is super ridiculous. <laughs> it is super ridiculous. Um, so there was a Marvel title in the. I feel like Douglas should be here because he'd do this better. Um, I, every time I talk about okay, every, formal. every time I talk about comics, I feel like I'm coming off the bench for Hillary or for Douglas Wall. Um, <laughs> but so this is a ridiculous character called the Fool Killer, who is a Defenders villain. The Defenders, who are now a TV show I haven't seen, were sort of the C-list super team from <laughs> Marvel in the 70s and 80s. 
Um, and they also had the first uh, gender queer or multiply gendered character in superhero comics, but that's a separate panel. Um, this was a guy who wore a hat and had ridiculous guns and shot people if they didn't have poetry in them. <laughs> the choice is yours. Live at home or die at home. Um, so, yeah. Um, but so, in order to be the ideal reader of the Defenders, which maybe no one should be because your time is valuable, um, you need to recognize this guy from previous appearances, and this guy, I have no idea who he is, um, and to know all the characters from their previous appearances, and uh, where we are, and why Marvel New York is not Marvel New York, and some of the same ways that Love and Rockets would like you to know all the different characters in their history, and so on. And... But can you remind me, how does that connect to the poetry? Can we get to Jeff Papo? Okay. But then we come back to that? That is that. that is, this is that. Okay. <laughs> so Jeff Clark, who's a very good critic who lives in Oxford, um, pointed out in this book, which if you care about superheroes, you should read. If you're here only for other kinds of comics, it's not worth your time to read, but you should know the arguments, because they're really valuable. But I hadn't seen this until we saw it. This property of script comics, where you get short installments that want you to know the history of everything, is a property that script comics do not share with feature film, or with realist novels, or with most other kinds of novels. But they share it with a lot of poetry, if you believe Harold Bloom. Because Harold Bloom, who is wrong about lots of things, but kind of right about this, thinks that really significant influential poems only have their full meaning and take on all the power that they bear inside them if you, as a reader, come to them aware of how those poems disagree with their precursor poems, which in turn disagree with their precursor poems, which in turn maintain a kind of argument about how to live and what language is and what's in your soul going at least back to Shakespeare and Milton. So that the history of poetry works in contemporary poems, if the poems are powerful enough in Bloom's sense, in the same way that the history of like Spider-Man works in Spider-Man comics. Do you see where this is going? So that's super continuity. Douglas calls this uh, super readers. Uh, Douglas Volk thinks that contemporary kind of Cape comics anticipate a super reader who's read everything, which is true for only some of them, but it's really true for some of them. Um, and a lot of poets work with this in mind. If you tried to read John Ashbery, and then you were just like, what? What's going on here? And then you went to a lecture on John Ashbery, and it was the wrong lecture for you, because the lecturer who loved Ashbery to death mentioned five other poets in the first five minutes. This is a property that many comics share with many poets, and neither of them share with most other artists. So let me ask other panelists, and um, maybe Chris, because we haven't heard from you yet, what you think about that idea. Uh, the super reading idea? Yeah. As someone who's in grad school and <laughs> is always telling students that they need to read more, I distinctly agree with that. <laughs> Makes sense. Uh, I think that's true, and I also think in some cases it might not be true, or you don't need to be a super reader to just see two amazing lines of things. This is an amazing experience, even if it doesn't remind me of haiku. Right. Right. So it seems, yeah, it seems to be something that's available in both these forms, but not required. Yeah. The forms invite it. Yeah. Uh, and they should be required, but sometimes they do. And if your genius is the genius of John Ashbery or of you know, your favorite comics maker who's super elusive and hard to get into, <laughs> um, but yeah, they should be required. Yeah, the comparison of the gutter and the line break, though, I completely agree with. I mean, when I'm teaching classes or going through a poem with one class or going through a comic with another, the main question, or one of the big questions we're asking ourselves, is what work do I have to do to get from this image to that image, whether an image is something you drew or something describing words. Um, for me, the joy and difficulty of both of these art forms is moving from comprehension to incomprehension to comprehension to incomprehension, stitching things together that way. So um, that's a great point. I'd like to um, ask anybody, um, so anyone feel free to answer this and jump in, about the sort of um, spatial site specificity of comics and the spatial site specificity of poetry. Obviously, we've already been talking about that if we're talking about the gutter and the line break. But I'm wondering if people have further thoughts about that. And I was reminded this morning of this great um, Susan Howe quote in the Paris Review, where she's talking about how she thinks of the space of the 
page for her as a poet, as a stage, that the words move across, which seemed really evocative to me, obviously, of theater, so she's talking about a stage, but also of, um, of, of comics, this idea of thinking the space of the page as the meaningful unit. So I was wondering if anyone had any thoughts on, about that. This is something that I deal with my work quite a bit because most of it goes online. And one of the components of what I'm doing, the moon fell on me, has to do with markup. There's, um, I've written programs that will generate markup that will put the images in a certain kind of um, arrangement in HTML. And there are some things I'm willing to let be flexible. Like if you have your browser open, a certain amount of the comic will look one way and look a different way if you open it up wider. And then there are there are some things about that that are not negotiable, like the order of the pounds. So that's something. Um, the uh, and I'm also every now and again putting liner notes in the source and comments. So if you hit Control U, you can get additional stuff going on. This is not one, but it's really cool. Battle <laughs> into this image. Yeah. Wow. Joshua, that, that's one really nice. I, I so want to do stuff with animation, and animation is just so hard. And yeah, I'll get to it. At any rate, there's, uh, so yeah, that, that whole idea of presenting some kind of structure, and you have to have enough structure for there to be a poetry experience, and not so much structure that it's weird. Um, and you have to give people hints, but also give them freedom to interpret. So there's always that dance between structure and freedom that I think you're dealing with as an artist in general, and this form in particular. Madeline, do you have any thoughts about that as a practitioner? Yeah. I mean, I think I love uh, the way that the panel break allows for calm and allows for quiet. Um, that's one of the things that I'm most interested in in my work is uh, the way that like attention can be built. Um, yeah, so in that line right there, you say the environment as though it is not you. Where are we if not here? Um, and if I if I wrote this as a text only poem, I could you know like do like a million line breaks as a way to slow the reading down. Um, but I, I love and I'm constantly fascinated by the way that um, the image slows the reader. And there's, you know, you're reading the text and then you're reading the space and then you're reading the image. Um, yeah, and so that's something that I've always thought about. Um, great, Steph, did you want to comment? The, the site specificity issue, the space of the page issue. Yeah. You already started to. Yeah, yeah. Um, so poems in general give frames to language. Um, and comics that use words, of course, give frames to language. Uh, and, and put the language in other spaces as well. I am very uncomfortable with definitions of poetry or of lyric poetry, and a lot of what Franklin and Madeline are talking about is specific to lyric poetry, poetry that attempts to embody a single moment with depth of emotion, which is my favorite kind of poetry usually, but it's not the only kind. Um, but a very comfortable definition of poetry that say that it has to use the space of the page. Susan Howe is really smart, um, but I don't, I, I can't read the way that she reads. Most of my favorite poems are still wonderful poems if you copy them over in ballpoint. <laughs> on like your notebook page and like pass them to your best friend as a note in class and then she unfolds them and sees in this blue light I can take you there snow having made me a world of bones seem true to you. <laughs> or let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediment. That's a poem no matter what it looks like on the page uh, as long as you know where the line break is. And if you didn't, you could probably guess from listening to us. Um, so for me, what's distinctive about almost all my favorite poems is that they are not, in fact, uh, dependent on uh, the color of the ink or the size of the page or where, whether they're at the top of the page or the bottom of the page. Poetry, for me, is not a visual art form. Um, 
but of course you can blend it with or connect it to comics which are a visual art form just like you can put a song in a future film um, and it changes the meaning of the song and makes the film better if you pick the right song uh, and sometimes the filmmaker even wrote the song which is what what you guys are doing so I'm, I'm yeah is that a hand that's up hi Yes, um, Nathan points out that concrete poetry is thin. Um, and the thank thank you for right. asking the question I was going to ask. You beat me to it. Excellent. I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, so concrete poetry is anomalous. Um, it does things sort of by definition that most poetry, at least in our culture, does not do. Um, but it's still poetry. Sorry. Just do we have a concrete poetry? Yeah, I don't know Anybody if I can define it from scratch. I, I think I've seen you define it. You've seen you define it. Yeah. Concrete poetry, at least as I understand it, is poetry often just done on a typewriter. Sometimes it's done just by hand within frames, where the visual arrangement of the words on the page makes some kind of recognizable image or just some evocative image. Is that pretty good? Yeah. And so, what do people think about the whole sort of visual poetry movement, a lot of it sort of hearkening back to the historical avant-garde, but also, um, you know, getting a lot of um, energy um, in the past decade or so. There's even been, you know, a Vizpo anthology, you know, multiple anthologies. I think they don't have enough pictures. <laughs> I actually agree with that. I think a lot of it falls between two schools. There's some of it that's really interesting to look at and then follow along and read to the extent that you can read them. But one of the things that uh, that was inviting about comics poetry was that so little had been done with them. And it wasn't... There's a thing about concrete poetry that is a little bit married to the typewriter in a way that I don't have a whole lot of... Like, oh good, a typewriter. A new word processor. Yeah, or, or something like that. And I think, um, and I've seen things that are actually not related to the typewriter or, or, nor a hinge on but rely on um, letterpress or, or that kind of aesthetic that will really hammer down the typeface. I think that um, some cool stuff has been done with that. I think that probably more stuff could be done with comics poetry, just reaching out into that whole syntax. I'm also a drawer, and I, I just like drawing, so that's me. Can I tell a brief story from our uh, class we'll have with Harvard? Yes, please. So one of the moments where I started really to think about how poetry and comics come together is when we had this, this amazing privilege. Alison Bechdel come to class and show us how she puts together a page of Fun Home. She showed it, a video of it at like 500% speed, so I think it takes her all day to make one page, but we got to see it in I don't know, 10 seconds. Uh, sorry, do you have a question? Yeah, wait, wait, but let me finish. Okay. Um, so the, the thing that blew my mind about what she did and made me think Alison Bechdel's maybe an amazing concrete poet is that she writes the words for Fun Home and maybe, I think, for the second memoir in Photoshop. She puts the images together, and she picks a text box of the size she wants to appear on the page. Then she writes within that text box to fill it and tries hundreds of different... So yeah, so when she makes this page, she knows, oh, I think I want a text box around that big. And she'll revise and revise and revise her words, take out punctuation, find synonyms to make it fit in that shape. Her method would kill me. <laughs> well, it's an amazing method. But it, it really showed me that when she's coming up with the verbal element of her compositions, that it's not at all removed from the all-at-once look of the page. Well, um, maybe the moment is now, since the work hands going up, um, to open it up for questions. So, um, yes. Um, so it seems like... This is getting recorded. Oh, okay. Oh, thank you. Hello. Um, now get off Hi, everyone. Um, so it seems like you're sort of talking about maybe how there's a disruption in sort of like the linear ways of reading um, in poetry and in comics. Oh, hi. Can everyone hear me better now? Okay. Um, so the disruption of like the linearity of reading in comics versus in poetry, I'm sort of wondering like, is it the same sort of disruption or sort of like what's the difference in um, the disruption that happens between, you know, and I guess that linear way of reading that poetry 
helps us do and that comics help us do. I'm just kind of curious what you're one of the cool things about forums is that there are very specific and diverse disruptions that you can toss at the reader, some of which are aimed at the reading, some of which are aimed at the viewing, and uh, some of which are combinations thereof. You can do weird things with time that you wouldn't necessarily be able to do in another form. You can, um, you can manipulate the distribution of elements across the page in a way that can be a jarring to the reader. So there are, because you are working with the whole syntax of comics, not just words, but everything around words and the drawings and the spacing between the images and everything else, there are a lot of things that you can throw at the reader. Thank you. Yes? Uh, this is probably towards Madeline, but um, I your, your creative process, because you know, most when you, when you create a comic, you, you write the script, you draw the image, but of course, the separation between illustrating a poem and writing a comic poem. So, basically, what is your process that makes it different than illustrating a poem? Right. Yeah. Um, so, for the way, so everyone works extremely differently. Um, some people who make work like this will like write a, basically write a text poem first and then sort of come up with images. Some will have images um, and then come up with text. Um, for this sort of thing and for the way that I've been working in the past few years, all of I will specifically meditate on a single person in my life or like a feeling that I have towards someone um, and then I'll come up with a set of images like and, a, and metaphors that I like that have to do with like what I'm thinking about and what they're feeling. Um, and then I'll, uh, so, so for this I had this image of a, a burning house. Um, and so I was thinking, and, and so, and then I'll sort of like write like a million, and I often work with this in this four panel format. Um, I'll write like a million four panel comics and then I'll sort of pare it down to ones that I think are working well and like there are words in and words out and, um, so it's it's, uh, it's sort of fluid. I don't know if that helps, but um, but yeah. So they, they both kind of come together and mix around a lot before something kind of comes out. Yes. With the head. Hi guys. Um, to me, poetry is is sort of like a consciousness. The way you see the world. And then you have the mediums where you have a written medium and you have a graphic medium. So I think poetry could be anything. But um, my question is, can comics, which is a visual and a text, can uh, poetry be just a, a visual representation in comic form with no text at all? Can that also be poetic comic? Yes. I would agree too. Because I yeah, absolutely. I think it, it would require you to do the same work to leap from image to image. Image to image. Yeah. Just the, the transition of image to image to image. Yeah, so in that sense, it's putting my brain, it's making my nerve endings do the same thing. Mm -hmm. It's maybe not giving me the same representation of a single consciousness that right. I would expect from. Like if I show you an image of a rose, but then. Like if I show you an image of a chocolate, rose, a glass of wine, then I'm done. That just disturbs you. Is that? That's that sounds, just a more fun. That sounds like a good <laughs> comic poem or a set of emojis. So yeah. <laughs> 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 just maybe the same thing. I'm actually well, there's a big link with emojis and comics, right? I've made a wordless comics poem. Unfortunately, it got uh, destroyed in the data loss, so I don't have it anymore. And I'm uh, angry about it. But the 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 thing that made it a poem, I think, was manipulating the story that was being told through the image. Mm -hmm. So even though there weren't words in the thing, there was a narrative to work with. Right, right, right. And once you have that, you can do language-like things with it. Yeah. One of the things we're seeing here is... Hi. Is this, is this on? Yep. One of the things we're seeing here is that the word poetry has a number of obviously related but not entirely coincident or coterminous meanings. Mm -hmm. So some things are, I mean, it, it, in this, it, 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 it's more vulnerable to this than the word comics. 
If you're here, you probably have you say some, more vulnerable than more comics. vulnerable than comics. If you're in this room, you probably have some idea of what comics is that's quite close to everybody else's idea. If you're an informed person and you spend a lot of time with comics, you have some idea of you know what what sequential art is. And you may disagree about like panel after panel of only words. Dylan Horrocks has this great argument about it online. You may disagree about whether a single panel comic is comics or not, but we have some sense. With poetry, there are multiple uses of the word in circulation and obvious examples of things that are poetry by one commonly accepted definition, but not by others. And if you write about what poetry is in general sometimes, which it's, it's you know, literally my job to do when asked, you have to disentangle those definitions from one another. And by the one that I use most often, actually a wordless comment, is it really poetry any more than it is like a movie? Yeah, but it can be great. It can be poetic. It can be light poetry. By another perfectly useful, acceptable definition, of course it's poetry. And it's worth thinking about adjacent words such as lyric and art and interiority and non-narrative and disruption as words that are related to what you think poetry means. Okay, so I have to ask you, since since you did point out it's your job to answer when asked. <laughs> so? <laughs> so I feel like that was an, almost an invitation. Um, so what, what would be your working definition? Of poetry? Yes. Um, oh. Oh dear, I, I did not see that coming. And I should have seen that coming. You said that was your job. <laughs> no. Um, so I have to work with a couple different definitions. The one that is most useful to me, and I am going to make this up as we go along, in a second, is um, uh, poetry is a set of practices, of ways of reading and writing that grew out of the history of verbal objects, objects made of language, that many people have called poems. <laughs> Most of these things have line breaks. Most of these things have strong emotions in them. Many of them are related to singing. Many of them are related to a expressing a unique personality. This is actually the next the book that I'm writing that's gonna to try to do for poetry, what Hillary is doing here, and then I have to turn it next week. It's called Don't Read Poetry. <laughs> it's called Don't Read Poetry because I don't want people to approach every poem with the same set of expectations. Just like you don't come to Dice to watch out for and expect it to be uh, out of our disruption, and you also don't expect it to be excellent. Um, but I like all three of those things for different reasons, and they're all comics, but they do different things for me. And I actually want people to be reading poems with a sense of the various practices that constitute poetry, rather than asking for or looking for the same thing every time they read poetry. So don't read poetry. It's a thing you should read. Don't read it. So I'm, I'm curious to talk about this slide that you um, sent me this morning. Can And this is a book, actually, that um, I, I taught along with Chris, who was my assistant for this course in, in my graphic novel course at Harvard. So why did you pick this image? I was particularly interested. Should I answer before or after we take the question from the gentleman who's had his hand up for a while? You should answer now, and then we'll take the question. Yeah, so um, Kyle Baker's amazing, terrifying book, Nat Turner, which is definitely comics, um, uses very few words. And so when the words pop up, she's a mad And the third thing that comics and most kinds of poetic practice have in common with each other, but not with, you know, for example, novels, is they enforce concision by putting special frames around words. And Kyle Baker's Nat Turner, which has so few words, is an extreme example of that general enforced concision. And you can probably think of counterexamples, like famously words, wordy comics artists. Um, but that's why that is there. Also, everyone should read it. You guys turned me on to that. I knew what it was, but I did feel it was great. They hadn't read it until you taught it, and then I realized. Um, well, I, I loved that comment because to me, one of the real connections is that um, poetry we can think of as a form of condensation, and obviously comics we can think of as a form of condensation. OK, yes, um, in the front row with the hand. <laughs> Up for a long time. Uh, yeah, it was, uh, related to the thing before this image, uh, 
because you mentioned singing, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about uh, sound and rhythm and how sound transcribed in um, comics doesn't need to be words, but can be images and words, and that's obviously something that can't be like, immediately transcribed in either, and how it relates to both. Yeah, so is this, is this for yeah, anybody in the anybody, middle of can you just Google things? Yeah, or is that not a good I prefer not to Google things. Do you want me to come up with something specific? Because then we. Graduate yeah. student, what do you think? <laughs> um, I mean, rhythm and the rhythm of my experience reading something seems to be something that the two forms share. Right. Even if it's not the rhythm of words or sounds, it could be the rhythm of panels. It could be the rhythm of like a panel this big versus one this big versus something that's like nine on the interesting scale and something else that's two on the interesting scale. So in that sense, yeah, I definitely see rhythm as like the two both have. But the question of sound in these two forms uh, came up to me recently because one thing I thought that poetry had that comics didn't have is you could do a poetry reading and it's kind of approximating right. reading poetry and you couldn't have a comics reading the same way. And then I went to a great comics reading. Oh, you did. What was it? It was um, Adrian Tony's reading, where he didn't quite he didn't quite do like a kindergarten storytelling uh -huh. with this book. He had a PowerPoint presentation where he could control the rhythm. He could show one panel at a time, he could show six panels at a time. Uh, it was a really good event. So now I'm just confused. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, so a lot of, so I think a lot about songs and about music, and in some way, like a four panel comic is like a kind of phrase of music for me, uh, especially because I'm, like I mentioned before, because I'm thinking a lot about rhythm um, and the way that the reader moves through things and like time. Um, yeah, music feels very close to what I'm doing. Visual rhymes and things like that. Okay, other questions? Yes. Alex? Yeah. Hi. Hi, Marie. <laughs> um, I, I had a question about uh, um, I think I, I'm still struggling to understand whether whether there is a distinction you're making between comics that are poetic and comics poetry. Um, because I feel like I've heard you guys give really interesting and strong arguments for what is innately poetic about comics. Um, and I, I guess I just wanted to get a clear idea of the genre. I mean, I think there are probably uh, more precise ways of using language to describe this sort of stuff. Uh, for me, comics poetry or poetry comics, which I, I haven't really thought of as a distinction, like just feels like a shorthand way to say, I make comics and there's not really a story, and there's, <laughs> and there's a rhythm, and I'm working hard to evoke something, but it's not, it's not necessarily going to be funny. Uh, and so it's, yeah, I think there's, I think you're pointing out there's room for more precise language that I think these folks have probably thought about hard. Uh, but for me, it's, it's almost a shorthand of, like, uh, yeah, of just, yeah, what I said, so. <laughs> Chris, did you want to talk about lyric? So, so poetry means lots of things, right? Lord Byron became famous 200 years ago for writing really, really long poems, and they all told stories, and some of them were really violent, ridiculous, and some were, were really funny. But when we think of like what's poetry and what's poetic, we don't think about writing funny stories unless we're reading writing for children. Um, we think about the kinds of poems that are called lyric which are serious and emotional and subjective and sometimes hard to interpret and sometimes really individual and sometimes putatively universal, but then are sort of one moment with a lot of depth of feeling. And a difference between the poetry comics and the comics poetry that you guys are doing and previous generations' use of short form comics to do things that seem poetry is that these are lyric. So, can you talk about this poem? Yeah, it's got a lot of line breaks that work like pattern breaks, okay. that's all. <laughs> um, where it changes, what, what you're seeing changes as you move from line to line. Um, I, I, I can demonstrate if you want, but... Okay, 
Okay. There's, then, there's, there's questions. Yeah. Franklin, did you want to pick up on Alex's question? A lot of these uh, definitional things, since the, the genre that we're talking about is so new, have not been hammered out very thoroughly. And these are interesting questions to think about, and the definitions are uh, a good mental exercise on some level. At the same time, the, uh, the question that I have to come back to as a creator is, does knowing this, does making a decision about this help me to make something? Sometimes the answer to that is no. If I feel like, oh, I'm, I'm you know, are people really going to consider this to be this kind of thing? The fact of the matter is I probably shouldn't be entertaining that question. I should just make it and then let other people decide what it is. Uh, I very much believe as an artist that you shouldn't be your own art historian. Mm -hmm. And that does go off into that direction if one becomes very involved in that, which is not to disparage how interesting it could be to really think about what it is that we're doing here. Sometimes that's necessary as well, but not usually for the creator. Thank you. Um, so we have time for uh, maybe two more questions. Okay, yes. Hi, I have a question I'm especially like to hear from Madeline about, which is... Can we speak up? Oh, sure. Um, so I'd, I'd like to hear about how you think about color and its impact on the images that you choose and and your poems and how, how color sort of just affects your work. That's a good question, thank you. Um, I think it's, a, it's another element. It's another element that can be used in sort of a rhyming way. Like often um, in longer pieces, I'll have there will be a color that appears and it speaks to one thing, and then it reappears and it speaks to a similar thing, and, and that connects that connects the reader. Like the reader's like, oh, I remember that red, and, and so that functions maybe in the same way that, that uh, a rhyming sound would in, in rhyming verbal poetry, um, or in the way that a repeated uh, like a like a tune in a song might like connect two points of meaning for someone. Yeah. Something that she does is a, um, which is something that you can do in, in comics poetry that you can't necessarily do in visual art, is use color in a linguistic sort of way or like a code way. Mm -hmm. like, this color is occurring, which means that something that happened that's the same color is happening again. And there are a lot of ways that you can play with that, mm -hmm. and she does a beautiful job of it. Also, Andrew White, whose work is up here, does that a lot. And he's someone who I, I learned that from um, in some of his longer pieces. Um, so two more questions, and then we will unfortunately have to wrap up. So we have one question over there, and then you had your hand up first. So it used to be that a comic had to be like on an 8 by 10 piece of paper, and you had to turn to see, am I speaking into the microphone? Yes. Yeah. You had to turn to see new things, and that was something to take into consideration, like spoiling a surprise or something. But now with the internet, you could do something like internally scrolling, or you can have one panel that goes on. It like, typically will take you like 30 seconds to scroll through it, or like animating pieces. Is that exciting, or does that give you anxiety? <laughs> Uh, that's super exciting because it something that I like to do is like I love the scroll and I love the potential of the digital format to just like there is such a like you can make such pause like you can make that reader just scroll and scroll and like and, the, and they're forced into this moment of silence that's almost I mean you could have like pages that are blank where they're turning and they're like what's next um, but I, yeah I love I love the potential of like the way that the digital format expands space. And so everything that space means, like there's more of it, you can play with it more. Thank you. Okay, last question. Sure. Uh, there's a, a comic book artist I follow called uh, Chris Square, and he does narrative uh, comics mostly, but there are a few uh, pages in the comics that he draws, which is non verbal completely visual. Mm -hmm. And the way he breaks it down is through um, channel breaks and you're supposed to infer from the visual the context of it, either a story or what it's supposed to visualize. Would you say the biggest element of creating poetry through comics is a panel break? 
or how you draw the image. I mean, I see both elements in his work, but uh, it's it's good to have a perspective of other artists as well. Interesting question. Analysts? You might flip through my anthology. <laughs> Because I have, uh, I have some people who are very deliberately using the panel and some people who are just kicking the panel down. So both of those are options. Panels as line breaks. I'll just add something really, really quickly um, because there's actually um, a chapter about Chris Ware, the book that um, I have the gallery for. I mean, I, I think your question is so interesting. Yes, panel says line breaks is interesting to think about. Also, the different size and shape of Ware's panels on one page and that kind of panelization calls attention to the rhythm of reading. Um, so it connects a little bit with what we were talking about before in terms of um, patterns of attention and concentration in a really interesting way. Okay, I think that we are sadly out of time. I'd like to give a big round of applause.